It's a lamp unto my feet. This is a road map for my future. And I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. And I can be what it says I can be. In Jesus' name. I want you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 4. And I want to begin reading with verse 2, Hebrews 4, 2. Would you say that, please? Hebrews 4, 2. If you don't have a Bible, you might want to move over to someone who does, and you can read along with them. But it says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Then in verse 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. Father, anoint your word with great power today in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen, and you may be seated. God bless you. I'm the son of a preacher, and growing up in a pastor's home, my dad started churches. That's what he did. It was something that was consumed in him. And over the years, he started churches all through Indiana, Kentucky, and my mother played the organ. And there was a period of time where my dad would bring along her organ and she would play, and he would preach, and they would start a church. They started churches in Bowling Green, and Hopkinsville, Owensboro, uh, all over the western part of the state. Uh, Dad uh, would start churches. And the one thing that he preached and was so stamped indelibly within me is that the final authority is the Word of God. It's the Bible. And the Bible says in the book of Galatians, if any other gospel is preached unto you, and even if an angel came and he delivered you this word, if it's different from what I've preached, you are not to receive it. You are, it is to be accursed. And so we live in a time when a lot of unusual things are happening and they're coming in the voice of the church. How can a pastor get up and perform a same-sex marriage or a church endorse transgender restrooms. How can we do that? Amen. Well, they do that because they don't accept the Bible as the infallible Word of God. They come with a new revelation. That new revelation reveals to them that the Spirit the Spirit is greater than the Word of God. And so therefore, the Word of God has to be subject to how the leading of the Spirit. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches, and that's not what we believe, and that's not what we're to teach our children and our families. This book doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says that heaven and earth shall pass away but my word will never pass away. Now what happens regardless if you're a church, if you're an organization, you get away from that truth that the Bible is God's word and cannot change and you get in trouble. You look at uh, some of the denominations. Every denomination started with the fire of the Holy Spirit. One of the denominations that had perhaps some of the most influence upon America in the early days was the Presbyterian Church. And uh, if you as a pastor, you research and you try to get sermons that are printed, some of the greatest preachers that ever preached were Presbyterian preachers. And the fact is, my grandfather, back uh, uh, many years ago, uh, attended a Presbyterian church out in Oklahoma. In those days, there weren't a lot of churches, and he would go to the church that was the most spiritual. And when he got up to give a word of testimony in that church, God baptized him in the Holy Ghost. And he opened his mouth and began to speak in other tongues in that Presbyterian church. And he apologized. He said, I, I don't know what happened to me. I just, 
but it was the Spirit of God that was working there. But over the years, if the leadership of the Presbyterians or any other church get away from the truth of God's Word, that church will begin to decline. Presbyterian Church moved here, to, and their headquarters is here in Louisville. They have a huge, beautiful uh, building downtown. Yet they begin to get away from the Word of God. They begin to come against Israel, and they begin to uh, preach not to buy goods from any group that um, came out of Israel. It was a Jewish group. You know, when you do that, you just kind of kick yourself because that means you can't use word computers, the word software. It means when you get sick, you can't use a lot of the medicines because all that comes from Israel, all that comes from the Jewish people. And consequently, they begin to get away from the word of God. They begin to endorse very liberal movements that were absolutely contrary to the word of God. What happened? there became a decline in the Presbyterian church. There became, they had to begin to lay off people. So now you go into their headquarters that used to be just filled with employees and those rooms are totally vacant. Why? Because they got away from the word of God. That happens to church after church, family after family. The word of God has to be the center of the truth. You look at the Red Cross. Why is it called the Red Cross? It's because Jesus is the healer, and it talks about the blood that was spilled, and Clara Barton, she helped found that. Uh, she was a nurse during the Civil War, and then Taft, who became one of our presidents, he helped fund it, but it was founded in a church. They had their organizational meeting in a church, it was based upon the compassion of Jesus Christ. And now down in Baton Rouge, in a Baptist church that the Red Cross was using, they would not even allow the people that were staying there to read the Bible. If they read the Bible, they were asked to leave. Prayer, well, you could not even offer prayer at the Red Cross. Why, how could this be? They got away from the very foundation of what has made us strong, and that is God's Word. Can I hear an amen? amen. Albert DeBose, he founded the NAACP. It's very interesting how he struggled in his life. It's one of the most interesting stories. He went to Fisk University in Nashville, and then he felt like God was leading him to Harvard. In those days, Harvard did not accept the credits from Fisk, and so he got two BAs, and then he became the first uh, African-American graduate from Harvard University with a PhD. And he believed differently from many other black leaders who wanted to subject themselves to a racist in the white community. And he said, no, he said, we can rise higher, and if we get our kids ed educated, and we press that through education and through God, they can rise to the very highest levels in this country. And so he founded the NAACP, and it stood for civil rights. The leaders, the whole foundation of that organization was the church, was Christian leaders. They proclaimed and they preached the gospel. They preached that it is our rights as children of God and we shall overcome. Somebody say amen. amen. But then along came in the, the 70s when uh, Carter was running for president. The NAACP, they called their leaders together. One of those leaders is uh, one of the leaders here today in our community. We had lunch with him. He told me at that meeting, they said to him, we want to join forces with the abortionists, with the feminist meeting, uh, movement. I want you to go back and organize your, pe your people that we're gonna stand with the abortionists as the NAACP. He said, I went back and we began to organize the people and we said, they are our friends. But he said, I've repented of this again and again and again. 
And then the NAACP joined the homosexual movement and they aligned themselves with them. And since that moment, since that time, abortions have run so rampant in the black communities that in some of the cities it takes three pregnancies to have one baby. And it, uh, has, it has caused the NAACP not to be respected now among the black leadership because they took a turn away from the Bible. It's the word of God that is our foundation. If I preach anything different from the word of God, don't listen to me. Reject me because it is the word of God that has to be our foundation in the name of the Lord. I want to share with you what happens when you begin to take a commitment to read the Bible. It's not just hearing the word of God uh, preached, but it's taking a commitment. I made a vow to God that every day I would read the Bible. And when I did, it was a life changer to me because I was in seminary and there were some days you'd get so busy you, uh, I wouldn't read. And I remember that when I made that commitment to God, I said, I'm going to read the Bible every single day. Since then, I've read it through 69 times on, on my 70th reading of the Bible today. I've read Proverbs almost every day of my life. Margaret and I, we read together. We'll read the book of Psalms together and uh, scriptures together every day. And what happens when you begin to read the Word of God, there are five things I want to share that will begin to happen for you and your family. The first thing that begins to take place is you become blessed and more prosperous and will make more money simply by reading the Bible. You say, Pastor Bob, how can you say that? Well, you begin to think like God thinks. Did God get up this morning and say, where am I going to get the money to feed all these fish? And these birds, man, they're multiplying. What am I going to do? No, God doesn't think that way, and we don't have to think that way either. There's a confidence. There's a strength that begins to get a hold of your life. And suddenly you understand that God is going to meet all of your needs. He's going to send people to help you. God is the, the, the great God who knows how to supply every need that we have. In the 1500s, there was a great religious persecution. And really, it was all over the Bible. The reformers, they wanted to put the Bible into the hands of the people. And the Church of England said, no, you're not uh, capable of understanding the Bible. It takes someone so educated and trained in the Bible that the average person cannot understand it. And uh, so don't read the Bible. But the reformers, they had the printing press now. And they began to print the Bible. And anyone who was caught with a Bible was executed. And one of the reformers in Scotland had a bodyguard by the name of John Knox. And John Knox uh, was arrested. His, the reformer was executed. And it was during this time that John Knox, he began to fast, and he fasted for one week. And the Lord said, I've called you into the ministry. And John Knox, there in Scotland, began to preach the gospel. He became eventually the founder of actually the Presbyterian Church. And he had a revelation, and that revelation was the Word of God is so simple that even a child can understand it. And so when he would start churches, he would do two things. He would start a school to teach people how to read because Scotland was such an illiterate uh, country. The fact is, it was like moving to some coal town in Appalachia. Uh, people couldn't read or write. It was the poorest uh, country in the, the British Isles. It was the poorest country in Europe. They looked down upon someone if they were from Scotland as being ignorant and illiterate. And so he taught them to read, and then he taught them a confession of faith. Just like the confession we make when we take our offering, we are people of God. God has a plan for our lives. God wants us to succeed and to be blessed. They would make this confession of faith. Every service, they would read the Bible, 
and a confession of faith. Well, it took about 50 years, but in 50 years, Scotland totally did a turnaround. The fact is, Scotland became the literary hub of not only Great Britain, but all of Europe, and in a hundred years, it became the center of the literary hub of the whole world. Robert Louis Stevenson, he was there, wrote Treasure Island, John Burns, 650 noted authors and poets came out of Scotland. And then it became the financial hub. Guys began to come up with ideas about finances that nobody in the world at that time had come up with. The guy who founded the Bank of England, guess where he was from? He was from Scotland. And then medicine. You know, Fleming, who uh, found, uh, uh, discovered penicillin, he was Scottish. There have been more Nobel Prize winners that have come out of Scotland than any other country in all of Europe. And why? Because the Word of God. When the Word of God comes, there comes creativity. There comes thinking that is beyond the normal thinking because we fill our minds with supernatural words from God. Hallelujah. And then the influence that came to America. Within a hundred years, the influence of Scotland began to spread, and it came here to America. It's interesting, the signers of the Declaration of Independence. There are more uh, people who sign with their roots from Scotland than any other place. Eleven presidents, their roots came from Scotland. LBJ, um, Andrew Jackson. Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson's dad was from Scotland. He was a Presbyterian preacher. He said, there's never been a day that I haven't read the Bible. When you read of the outstanding people that came from Scotland, there's Thomas Edison. There's Andrew Carnegie, who was the richest man in the world, and when he came here, he didn't have two nickels to rub together. Stonewall Jackson, John Breckenridge, and the list goes on and on and on. Hamilton, who's on our $10 bill. He was from Scotland. The influence upon our nation is branded because of the power of the Word of God. And when you begin to read the Bible, God begins to anoint you. He begins to anoint your family, and he places a blessing upon your life. Somebody say amen. amen. The second thing that happens when you begin to read the Word of God there's a spirit of wisdom that comes upon you. Wisdom to know what to do. Wisdom where you don't embarrass yourself. Wisdom to keep you on the right track. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, how much better than fine gold is wisdom. And with the acquisition of understanding is choicer than silver. It's more to be desired than gold, than fine gold, the Bible says. The Bible says if you will pursue the Word of God and you'll pursue wisdom like you pursue money, like you go after making a living, God says it will direct you, it will give you honor, it will give you long life, and will give you riches. Now you think about that. If you will pursue the Word of God, it will give you honor. People will respect you. It will give you riches. God will begin to bless you financially. And it will give you a long life. And it denotes not only to live long, but a quality of life. Somebody say, Amen. Hallelujah. We had a, a man who came here to church, and he had uh, a real bad dyslexic problem. Fact is, he could not read or write. He was an adult. God saved him. God filled him with the Holy Spirit. And he began to pray, Lord, I want you to teach me how to read. And he got these tapes by Alexander Scorby. He was a fellow who used to read the Bible. And um, you sat there and listened to him on those tapes. And he took the book of Romans and would play those tapes. And he, that's how he learned how to read. And God began to bless him. Today he has a, a large business. God's prospered him. God has made him very successful. And it all happened through the power of the Word of God. The, the young man who heads up our media department, 
He was born with such a, a reading disorder that when he was the fourth grade, they never did think he could read. They thought if he could just do his name, he uh, will be successful and maybe he can learn some kind of trade. And we were having a revival here with an evangelist by the name of, of Jerry B. Walker. And his parents brought Trey to that meeting and he, there were so many people there, he couldn't even get up there for him to pray for him. But my mother, my mother said, let me pray for you. And she prayed for Trey, and when he went back to school, and it was one of these specialized schools, God had healed his mind. Amen. Suddenly he was able to put those things together. He, he couldn't hardly talk. But God healed him. And it took him a little while to catch up, but he went on to college, he became successful, became an excellent student. It's the power and strength of God's word. Somebody say, I receive that in the name of Jesus. So God's word, it helps you to prosper, it helps give you wisdom, and then it brings a healing in your body. It brings a healing in your emotions. It brings a healing in your family. It brings a healing to your whole being. You know, the Word of God says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, raise your right hand. Say, I love this scripture. Say, this is my favorite scripture. It says, my son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. Say, health to all their flesh. That word health is the same root word that medicine comes from. The Word of God is medicine to all their flesh. It's like, it's like taking a pill. It's like taking some medicine, and it, it brings healing. The Bible says he sent his Word and healed them and delivered them from all their diseases. In Isaiah 55, it says uh, the, the Word of God will not return void, but it will accomplish that which I sent it to do. In Hebrews 4.12, we read it, the word of God is quick and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. There's a healing. What would happen in your family with, you, with kids that are rebellious, with all the things going on? You said, hey, we're going to read the Bible. And you read three verses, and they read three verses, and they read three verses. Let me tell you what would happen. Day one, you would have World War III. That's exactly what would happen. I don't want to read it. Or when they read it, they'd read it in a nasal tone, tone that nobody could understand it. You have to have the gift of interpretation to even understand what was said. Then you go to the second day and the third day. And about the third day, things start calming down. Then the fourth day, there's a peace that comes. On the fifth day, you can begin to understand what they're saying. But within a matter of a short time, there's peace and there's strength and there's a healing and there's a power and a restoration that begins to come into that family. That's exactly what would happen. And, and I had a lady, she was shaking my hand as she went out. She said, Pastor, would you pray for my son? He's absolutely out of control. I don't know what to do. And I said, uh, well, how old's your son? He said, he's six. He's in the first grade. I said, well, if you don't get control of him now, he'll end up in the, in the penitentiary when he grows up. And so she said, well, what can I do? I've prayed and prayed and prayed. I said, well, why don't you read the Bible to him? And so she told me the next week, she said, I started the next day on Monday, and as he ate his cornflakes, I'd read the Bible. And he said, I don't want to hear that. He would make noises trying to interrupt her. But she said, I decided I was going to do it. The next day, I just kept, I just read again. He, she said on the, he said on the third day, he began to calm down. On the fourth day, he began to participate. She said, God has healed my son. There was a strength and a healing that began to come through the Bible. Oh, hallelujah to Jesus. Now, you know, medicine, when, you, when a person takes medicine, did you know a medicine is... Uh, it has no, it plays no favorites. And the word of God is medicine to our flesh. It play, pays no favorite, favorites. I don't care what your educational background is. I don't care what your color is. 
I don't care what your preferences are. It works the same. Amen. If you start reading the word of God, a strength, a power, and anointing begin to come into your life. Medicine sometimes takes a little time to kick in. You know, you just don't take it and jump up. Man, I'm well, I'm well, I'm well. Well, it's the same with the word of God. You start taking that word of God, it starts getting into you, and before you know it, it starts kicking in. The favor of God comes upon you. The right decisions begin to take place in your life. You know, that's, that's why, how some of these ugly guys who don't have anything going for them, they start reading the Bible, and suddenly they show up with a hot-looking girl, beautiful, number 10. Where'd you get that? I got it from the Word of God, Brother Bob. I started claiming it in Jesus' name. So the Word of God, it, it has the power to prosper you. It has the power to make you wise. It has the power to heal you. But let me tell you what else it does. It has power to save your soul. Some of you here today, and you come to church, and, you know, you go through all the motions, but down deep you say, God, I just want to make it to heaven. Lord, if I could just die saved and go to heaven, I'd be happy. Well, let me tell you, there's a lot more to it than just dying and going to heaven. Amen? Amen. But one of the things the Word of God do, will do, it'll keep you from going to hell. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I think one of the great classics is... Uh, a book that was written, they made it into movies, and they've done it several movies on it. It was Mutiny on the Bounty. And on that, uh, in that story was Captain Bly, who was a ferocious naval officer. And there were nine of the sailors that rose up in a mutiny. And of course, of, according to naval law, anybody who rose up in mutiny, it, they were, it was punishable by death. So these nine sailors, they were drunken, they, were, they, uh, they got into a boat and they escaped to a little island that's a little dot in the Pacific called Pictron Island. It's only about a mile wide and about two miles long. And they got there with um, some Tahitian women. And after 10 years, through fighting and through drunkenness, all the men had died off except one man, his name was John Adams. Now, this part of the story is not in that movie, and it's not in the book, but this is true. There were 11 women and 28 children, and John Adams. And he began to go through the ships, uh, one of the, one of the uh, boxes there, the chest, and he discovered the Bible of the ship, the ship's Bible. So he began to read it. He had never read the Bible before, and when he did, a conviction began to come upon him, and he began to pray. And then he began to teach the Bible to those children, and that whole group came to Christ. They all accepted the Lord, and today, Pickering Island has a population of a little less than 100, but almost all of them are Christian people. And it was because they began to read the Bible. The Word of God has power to break demons off of your life. It has power to break the curse of hell, of poverty, of Satan. It has power to break generational curses in Jesus' name. One of the great founders spiritually of our country was a man by the name of George Whitfield. He was a running mate with John Wesley, who founded the Methodist Church, and Wesley stayed in Great Britain, and, and it was George Whitfield that came to America. And when they didn't have microphones, he would preach to crowds of 30 and even up to 50,000 people. And one of his uh, favorite admirers was, uh, uh, was uh, Benjamin Franklin, who loved to hear him preach. But there were many people that uh, opposed him. And there was a fellow by the name of Thorpe who got a, a group together called the Hellfire Club. And they would make fun of him. 
And George Whitfield, he was uh, nearsighted. He could see near, but he couldn't see far, and so he'd squint. And he'd preach, and he'd start squinting, and they called him Squintum. And they made fun of him. And this guy Thorpe got where he could mimic him. I mean, he could sound just like George Whitfield, and then he would, he would squint like him, and, and it was really kind of comical. And so he was in a bar, and they were making fun of him, and he got up, and he, he began to squint like Whitfield, and he began to preach one of his sermons. And when he did, suddenly the Holy Spirit arrested him. And right in the middle of making fun and preaching this sermon, he sat down. His face turned white. What's wrong with you? He began to weep. And he accepted Jesus into his life. He became one of the strong supporters of George Whitfield and became an outstanding church leader. What was it? It was the power of the Word of God. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. Why do you think the devil wanted to take the Bible out of our schools? Why do you think they wanted to take prayer out of our schools and out of... You can't even pray now at the, at the ball field. In, in many of the military bases, they won't even allow the soldiers to have a Gideon Bible anymore. Why? Because the devil knows the power of the Word of God. Hallelujah to Jesus. Then I want to close with this. The Word of God has the answer to all life's problems. One time I said, you know, the Bible has all the answers. And a guy looked at me and says, well, how much do I weigh? So, well, it doesn't have that answer, but it can help you lose weight. But the Word of God, when you begin to think, it has answers to every situation that you ever face. In, uh, in, in Egypt, years ago, Standard Oil sent one of its top engineers to look for oil. They were there for months, and they couldn't find any trace of oil. And just before he came back, that night he was reading the Bible, and he was reading in Exodus where they took this basket and they put pitch on it, and they hid Moses in the bulrushes. And the engineer suddenly said, you know, if there's pitch, there's oil. And so the next day he took some of his men and he went over to Goshen, that area where the the Hebrews lived, and there they found oil. The wells are still pumping today. It came from the Bible. I think one of the, the, the most interesting stories is about mishmash. Say that with me, mishmash. If you can spell it, I'll give you 25 cents at the conclusion of the service. <laughs> mishmash, you read about it in Second Samuel, and it was a very interesting place because you can make a, a, a movie there, a Wild West movie, because it's in the mountains, probably 20 or 30 miles out of Jerusalem. But in these mountains, there is a, a, little, a little road that goes back, but it's, it's, it's these mountains on either side, so if you try to go down there, just like in the Wild West, the Indians are up there shooting down on you, and it's a little canyon that you would be destroyed. It's totally no way you can make it back with, with, your, with your scalp if they were Indians. And then at the end of that canyon, it's a big opening, and there was a town there called Mishmash. And at the end of the town was a cliff, a straight cliff that nobody could climb. And so it was a town that was impregnable, could never be captured. And in the Bible, there's a story of Saul who came up against 200,000 Philistines camped at Mishmash. He had 3,000 soldiers. And in the Bible, it tells about Jonathan and his armor bearer. They came around from behind and were looking up the cliff. And on top of that cliff, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet high was the town. And so he said to his armor bearer, he said, you know, God could give us this. He said, let's shout up to those soldiers that are guarding this part of the camp. And if they invite us to come up and fight, we know that God will give us this battle. If they say, no, we'll come down and fight you, we'll know that, that God won't give us the battle. 
So they yelled to these soldiers and they said, come on up. And so here is Jonathan and his, his armor bearer. They begin to find this little snake path and they begin to make their way up to the top. And when they did, they killed 18 Philistines. And there was such a racket, it scared the whole 200,000 Philistines and they began running. And as they came down that little canyon, the Israelites began to kill and destroy them. And God gave the Israelites a victory over 200,000 Philistines with only 3,000 soldiers. Somebody give the Lord a great praise clap for that. Amen. <laughs> well, what happened in 1917 was the year of Jubilee. Just like we're coming to the end of, of this year of Jubilee and it's going to kick in. Well... The Jubilee is that things would be restored, and for almost 500 years, the Turks had controlled the Holy Land. And in 1917, Allen became, and he seized, uh, he seized Jerusalem. And he sent up planes, and these planes flew over, and they dropped handbills, surrender, uh, surrender, and he signed it, uh, Allenby. Well, the... The, the Arab uh, translator didn't know how to spell Allenby, so he spelled Allah. And so here's people who've never seen a plane, never seen electricity. They had these handbills fall from heaven, and the Bible says, as a bird flieth over, so God shall deliver Mount Zion. And it was like God just fulfilled that in the name of Jesus. So during the night... This whole, this large army, and they estimated 18,000 Arabs, they fled Jerusalem, and they went down to Mishmash. And so when Allenby pursued them, and they came, they estimated if we go down that canyon, said we will lose over half of our soldiers. But they estimated what the cost would be. They had to defeat these these. Uh, uh, Turks. And so that night, one of the lieutenants was reading the Bible and he started reading from 2 Samuel and he read the story that I just told you about Jonathan. And he thought to himself, if Jonathan climbed up that cliff, there must be a path up that cliff. So he went and woke up the captain and the, and the colonel. He says, look, I, I, I know here's the story in the Bible. Why don't you give me some men and a machine gun, and we'll, we'll find that path, and we'll come in from behind. And that's exactly what happened. They found a little snake trail, probably the same trail that, that uh, Jonathan and his armor bearer climbed. And they climbed up, they set up a machine gun, and when daylight came, they started firing and shooting, and those Turks, 18,000, surrendered to the to the British army, and not one British soldier was lost in that battle. You read about it, it's one of the famous battles of World War I. Let's give the Lord a great big praise clap. Hallelujah. Well, I'm here to tell you God's got the answers. He's got the answers for you, and if you will take the Bible, and you'll just begin to read it. You'll begin to read it this month. Every day, even before you eat, I'm going to read the Bible. And you'll read it systematically. God will begin to speak to you. God will begin to direct you. If you're having confusion in your family, you and your companion begin to read it. You'll be amazed the healing and the peace that will begin to come in the name of Jesus. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here and you say, Pastor, I'm not right with God, but I know God brought me here today. And I want you to pray for me. Can I see your hand? Just slip your hand up right now. Yes, God bless you. God bless you over here. God bless you over here. God bless you here. Yes, God bless you over here. If you're here and you say, Pastor, I, I, I want to know for sure that I'm going to go to heaven if anything happened to me. Can I see your hand? Just slip it up. Yes, 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 yes. How many here and you say, Pastor, there's so much confusion and trouble in my family. I need God to bring a healing in my family. Would you include me in that prayer? Would you hold your hand up? Yes, 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 yes. How many here say, Pastor, I need direction. 
I need guidance. I need God to show me what to do. I, 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 I'm in a terrible mess. I need God's direction. Let me see your hand. Yes, 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 yes. I'm in a healing in your body. You need God to do some type of physical healing. The hand's going up all over here. I want to pray for you. I want us all to stand. Everybody standing. If you raised your hand for any of these, I want you to come right down to the front. I want to pray for you right down here. I want you to come. Maybe you didn't even raise your hand, but you want to be included. I want you to come too. Hallelujah. As you begin to come, I want us to just I want us to sing a song as you come down here. Hallelujah. Sing it again. He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. I want us to begin to just praise the Lord out loud. Come on, all over this building, I want you to just begin to praise God. If you have your prayer language, begin to praise him in your prayer language. Come on, don't hold back. Just begin to worship the Lord right now. Hallelujah. I want everyone to place your hand over your heart. I want you to pray with me out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Lord, you've got a plan for my life. And the devil's not included in that plan. Now, devil, get out of my life. I'm not going to serve you. You're not going to rule over my future. But I rededicate my life to you, Lord Jesus. Take out of me unforgiveness anger take it out of me Lord and fill me with your love fill me with your peace fill me with your gentleness fill me with your righteousness in Jesus name write my name in the Lamb's book of life now I want to come against every attack on your home and upon your marriage and upon your family Devil, I bind you off of every person here today. I declare that there's Jesus reigns in our homes. I come against every divisive uh, element that would try to divide our marriages and divide our children. And I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. Devil, you're a liar. Take your hands off our sons. Take your hands off our daughters. I rebuke this in Jesus' name. I declare your name is Jehovah Shalom. You're the God of peace over our families and over our marriages in Jesus' name. I come now against sickness. Place your hand on that part of your body where you need God to touch you physically. I come against problems with your lungs and your heart. I speak healing to your joints in the name of Jesus. Healing to your back. 
I command infection to leave you now in Jesus' name. May you begin to feel better for the glory of the Lord. I rebuke and, and curse diabetes off of you and out of you. Come out, you devil, in Jesus' name. You'll not have cancer. You'll not die before your time. But may God strengthen you and lengthen your days in Jesus' name. Someone here has had an issue with your nose. Inside, there's polyps have been in your nose. It's affect your breathing. God's healing you in the name of Jesus Christ. God's touching you for the, Lord, the glory of the Lord. Problems around the heart, angina. God's touching you now in Jesus' name for the glory of Christ Jesus. Now lift your right hand, everyone. I speak God's direction to guide you and direct you and to guide your future in the name of Jesus. May you make decisions that will bless you and help you and, and profit you and increase you in the name of Jesus. May every decision we make be the right decision for the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now I want you to join hands with people on either side of you. I want you to begin to pray that God would bless them right now. I want you to break any curse off of their lives, any attack off of them. Father, we just join together and we pray for those on our right and those on our left. Devil, you have no rights. You have no authority. Your power is broken in the name of Jesus Christ. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. We're a creation that you have no power over in Jesus' name. Your power is broken through the cross of Jesus. Through the blood of Jesus, we've been made anew. Our sins are forgiven. We, we have the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Father, I speak victory. I speak blessing in front and in back and on either side of us in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Now I want you to begin to pray for your families by name. Begin to call their names out loud to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for our families. I pray today for Justin and Jessica. I pray, Lord, that you would be with them. And, Lord, you would bless them and you would draw them close to you. I pray for Rachel. I pray for Rex. I pray for Margaret, Lord. I declare your kingdom come and your will be done. I pray for Landon and Jacob and Lincoln and John and Elizabeth. I draw a circle about our families, and I bless our families in Jesus' name. I pray for Sherry and Jonathan. I pray for Chuck and Kathy and Trent and Jeannie and Angela and Melody and Lindsay. Father, we, our families, are blessed in the name of Jesus Christ for your glory and for your honor. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, let's just lift your hands up. Begin to thank God right now. Come on, begin to thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you that we have victory in the name of the Lord. No weapon formed against us will prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against us in judgment, we shall condemn in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I want you to look up here just a moment. All of us have the same amount of time. That's the only thing that makes all of us equal. We all got the same amount of time. But if we'll take a part of that time and we'll give it to God every day, and you will begin to read the Bible, God will begin to release strength and favor and the power of the Word over your life. And I'm going to ask you to begin to take and read the Bible. If you've never read the Bible through, I want you to read it through. Don't do one of these little numbers, just open it up. Well, I wonder what God has to say for me today. Oh, here it is. Read it systematically. Underline it. A Bible you won't write in, that Bible's too holy for you. You need to get a Bible you can write in. When God speaks to you, underline it. Let God speak to you. How many will say, Pastor, it's my goal to read the Bible every day. And I see your hand. Hold your hand up. Hold your hand up. If you'll begin to do that, if you can read it with your family, that's even better. God will bring peace for your home in Jesus' name. 
Hallelujah. I want to, come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise clap. Hallelujah. I want us to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hallelujah. In just a moment, we're going to shout the name of Jesus three times. But I want to mention tonight on the bell of Louisville, I hope you'll come. We're going to have great music. We've got a lot of young preachers.